I want to welcome everyone today. Uh, we're joined by Lanhee Chen. Uh, Lanhee is a, a Hoover Fellow, a presidential campaign advisor, a frequent commentator on American politics, and a recent candidate for statewide office in California. And I'll introduce him in, in just a moment. Um, today's event is brought to you by the Wiedenbaum Center on the Economy, Government, and Public Policy. Um, the event is also co-sponsored by WashU's Political Science Department and Washington University's School of Law, Public Interest, and Policy Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Andrew Reeves. I'm the director of the Wiedenbaum Center and professor of political science. <laughs> Uh, before we get to the main event, we want to say a little bit about the Wiedenbaum Center. Um, for those of you that, that might be joining us for the first time or for the first time in a while, uh, we put on a host of public affairs programming each semester. Uh, last semester, we heard experts weigh in on topics ranging from the midterm elections, immigration, Ukraine, Medicaid expansion, and, and many more uh, topics. Um, we also invest substantial sums into supporting uh, cutting edge social science research here at Washington University. Uh, let me mention one of our very next events on February 10, uh, we'll host Nate Jensen, who's a professor of political science and business at the University of Texas. His a very catchy talk title is The $100 Billion Open Secret, How Politicians Use Economic Development Subsidies to Win Re-Election. Um, it should be a great event. Nate has done a lot of research on how local governments use incentives to try to lure companies uh, to their jurisdictions. So you might think about uh, a few years back when Amazon uh, spurred a bidding war, right? Trying to get different cities to offer incentives packages to bring them to their communities. So Nate has done extensive research on that. And we hope you uh, consider joining us for that event, which will be both in person and, uh, and online. And Alana just put a link to that in the chat. So if you're interested, give that a click and, uh, and sign up. Um, the Wiedenbaum Center has a dedicated and generous group of supporters. Um, if you're not already one of those supporters, I hope that you'll consider uh, giving us a close look. And to tell you a little bit more, I'm going to hand it over to our amazing Elliott Society co-chairs, uh, Molly Knight or Molly Klein and Steve Knight. And I think Molly is going to go go ahead and go first. So I'm going to hand it over to her. Thank you, Molly. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Again, I'm Molly Klein and I'm co-chair of the Wiedenbaum Center's Elliott Membership Committee. And along with Steve Knight, our other co-chair, who you will also hear from shortly, we welcome you to today's event with Lonnie Chen. It's so nice to see you all and many of the Wiedenbaum Center members have joined today. And a special thank you for your generous support which contributes to excellent program like today's and the one that Andrew just mentioned. To the fans and followers uh, who have joined us for today's event, we'd like to invite you to consider becoming Wiedenbaum Elliott members. We aren't bashful. We would love more members and you don't have to live in the St. Louis region to be a member. All states are welcome. I've been a member now for over 11 years and feel more informed as a citizen on the economy, government, and public policy issues. I've learned so much from the Wiedenbaum Center professors, graduate students, and distinguished, distinguished guests like today's. Thank you. So I'm going to turn this over right now to Steve Knight, our other co-chair, and he's going to continue with some of his thoughts on potential membership. Steve? Hi, Molly, thanks so much. Um, I'm a newer member, really, of the Wiedenbaum Center than Molly is, having only been involved for the last few years, but uh, we're living in a time when certainly, along with probably most of you, 
my concern and interest in the affairs of our nation and our public institutions has only become more acute. And my need, if you will, for sources of information that are scholarly and academic and research-based and not clickbait or things designed to push my buttons and get an emotional reaction has only increased. And Washington University is an amazing institution. And the Wiedenbaum Center within the university is especially um, unique in that it combines an interdisciplinary approach between sociology, economics, and political science with deep connections to the law school and other schools. And that interdisciplinary scholarly approach has just become more and more valuable. And there's an aspect to the Wiedenbaum Center that is less visible to our members who come to events like this. And that is a really critical dimension. The Wiedenbaum Center supports research to an extremely um, uh, powerful extent. Uh, to give you an example, uh, in, in, the year, in the fiscal year 2021, the center approved over $800,000 in new research grants from our own funds and also provided uh, extensive support for external grants, external grant proposals that resulted in over nearly a million dollars in new grant awards to our faculty members. And you can follow Wiedenbaum Center in the news and scholarly uh, uh, papers by Wiedenbaum supported professors, but I always wanna emphasize that because it's less visible, but especially crucial. As Molly said, we invite all of you to uh, uh, join with us, if you will. And I'll just mention, uh, if you check our website out, you'll notice we've got a number of upcoming events. And I'll just mention on February uh, 10th, there's a public policy forum with Nate Jensen that's going to be uh, on campus uh, at 2 p.m., but also hybrid, so a chance to join by Zoom. On February 16th, there'll be a noon public policy lunch, again, on the Washington University campus, but also hybrid, so those out of state can join. And on March 9th, another public policy lunch uh, at noon. And in those lunches, you'll hear from uh, at least a couple of researchers uh, exploring vital areas of interest to all of us. So please join us and the link to learn more is in the chat and probably will reach you in a follow-up email. Uh, thanks. Great. Over thanks. to you, uh, Andrew. Great, thank you so much, uh, Steve and Molly. Um, all right, let me uh, introduce Lan He. Uh, the Wiedenbaum Center is honored to host Dr. Lan He Chen. Lan He is the David and Diane Steffi Fellow in American Pu uh, Public Policy Studies at Hoover. He's the Director of Domestic Policy Studies in the Public Policy Program and an affiliate of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford. Chen was the Republican nominee for California State Controller in 2022. Uh, and in that race, he garnered more votes than any other Republican candidate in the country during that election cycle. Lanhe is also a veteran of several high profile political campaigns and has also worked in politics, government, academia, and the private sector. Lanhe has advised numerous major campaigns, including four presidential efforts. In 2012, he was policy director of the Romney-Ryan campaign and served as Governor Romney's chief policy advisor, a senior strategist on the campaign, and the person responsible for developing the campaign's domestic and foreign policy. Uh, Chen also advised Senator Marco Rubio's 2016 presidential bid, served as domestic policy director of Romney's uh, 2008 campaign, and was a health policy advisor to the Bush-Cheney re-election campaign in 2004. During the 2014 and 2018 campaign cycles, Chen served as a senior advisor on policy to the National Republican Senatorial Committee. In addition to his academic appointments, Chen is a partner at the Brunswick Group, a global uh, business advisory firm, 
and chair of the board of directors at El Camino Health in Northern California. He earned his PhD and master's degree in political science from Harvard, uh, JD cum laude from Harvard, and a AB magna cum laude also from Harvard. So uh, welcome, Lanhi, and thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, Andrew and I have known each other for 20 years, over 20 years now. We actually met in graduate school. And so uh, it's always great to be with him. And, and even though only virtually, it's a, a pleasure to be with all of you. So thank you. Great. Yeah, next time we'll need to, to get, you, uh, get you on campus. Um, so we, uh, let me say before we dive in, um, I have some questions for Lon He that I'm going to ask. Um, some of those are questions that you all submitted beforehand. Um, for our uh, folks that are joining us today, the chat is open. So if you have questions that you'd like to ask, please enter them in the chat and I'll, I'll keep an eye out and we'll um, get to those as, as we can. Um, so Lanhi, the first thing I wanted to talk about was your recent run for, for office. You, were, you ran for controller in the state of California. And so let me just open up and, and I'd like you to sort of talk about why you ran for that office. Um, you know, as, as a Republican deciding to run statewide in California, you know, what was the, the thought there? And maybe some reflections on, on what you learned from, from that experience. Yeah, so really what you're asking is what would possess you to do something so crazy <laughs> as, to, as to run for office. I, I think that, um, well, there's a few things. Obviously, as you noted in, in my personal background, I've spent a lot of time in policymaking and political circles. And over the years, what's become pretty clear to me is that we are experiencing in many places and many parts of our country a, a failure of governance. Uh, I think that if you look at the political incentives in our in our system right now, uh, there is an incentive for extremism. There's an incentive for uh, whatever will get the most activity on social media. Uh, there's a tremendous interest in brand building as opposed to policy making. And I think all of those trends to me were were deeply troubling. And I think the failure of governance manifests itself in many ways. Uh, you know, you can look at it at the federal level and, and ask why we don't see more action on issues where there appears to be significant bipartisan consensus, whether that's reform of our immigration system, uh, our nation's gun laws, there's all sorts of, of ways in which you would imagine we'd be able to reach greater consensus to address some of our, our challenges. Uh, here in California, which is my home state, the state that I grew up in, the state that I'm coming to you from today, the state that my wife and I will, will raise our family in, um, I think the failure of governance has manifested itself in many ways, um, and it's uh, unfortunately some of those ways maybe some of you have encountered and interacted with. If you look at our major cities in California, we are struggling with um, a homelessness crisis that affects too many people. San Francisco and Los Angeles have become dramatically different places than they were when I was growing up uh, in Southern California. Uh, you look at the massive swings we have in our state budget, where we go from almost $30 billion in surplus one year to $30 billion in deficit the next because of a tax system that's fundamentally broken. We have a lack of accountability, which really is the root cause of, I think, a lot of our challenges in this state and perhaps in others, where we have hundreds of billions of dollars, in fact, $300 billion a year our state spends with no real accountability for where the money goes and the efficacy of that spending. So as for why I ran, I think fundamentally, uh, I, I thought that I could make a difference in, in making governance better in our state in governing from the middle out rather than from the outside in. Uh, I was very focused, you know, the controller is kind of like the chief financial officer of the state, and I wanted to bring the experience I had in policymaking and academics and in the private sector uh, to bring a more workmanlike approach to what we were doing here. I thought if we could figure out where some of this money went for homelessness, for example, where the state spends $30 billion a year only to see escalating numbers of people ending up on the streets, uh, I really felt like uh, we could move the needle on, on trying to govern the state a little better. Um, you know, the politics of California are, uh, are, are pretty easy to figure out. Uh, Republicans are outnumbered by Democrats two to one. Uh, more people, at least until very recently, were registered without party preference than as Republicans. Uh, and I really feel like to be viable and to be uh, a, a, a true part of a governing 
uh, majority again. Republicans need to take a good hard look at what they're doing in California and elsewhere. Uh, and I felt I could be on the vanguard of a, of a new movement of the center right where we present uh, views that are based on facts and, and you know, rooted in, in research and sound thinking, uh, but reflect an understanding that the role of government ought to be limited. Uh, and so I thought I could help present that and, and move that ball forward. I'd, I'd like to think we did, even though we, we weren't successful in the campaign. We managed to make great headway. Uh, my campaign team, in fact, recently did an analysis that showed we were able to win some counties in California that Republicans haven't contested in, in decades. Uh, we were able to, to move the ball forward on demonstrating that there can be responsible governance that does not come from the majority party. And, and Andrew, let me just conclude with this thought, which is, you know, one party rule is not good anywhere. I don't care if it's Republicans running a state or Democrats running a state. I'd say that about uh, some states where where I have Republican friends who are in charge and they've been in charge for 20 or 30 years. I think that's a horrible concept. Uh, I think just the same way Democrats being in charge for 30, 20 or 30 years is a horrible concept. So uh, one of the reasons that I think we were able to move the ball and move the needle on on uh, on our campaign was because people said, listen, we need to check on what's going on. And, and I think the more we make that argument, the more we can demonstrate that there's a responsible way to do that the more possible it's going to be to see some kind of, of political change. But there's no question it's a, it's a long ways away. So we'll, we'll, I want to come back to some of these um, sort of themes around national politics, but, but I want to spend a little more time talking about your, your run for controller. Um, you did remarkably well. I mean, I think your margins were better than any you know, Republican presidential candidate we've seen there in a while. Um, you talked a little bit about sort of this new vanguard of, of Republican politics. I'm wondering what lessons you learned that you think will travel in terms of, of you know, advice for the National Republican Party or maybe um, uh, individuals in other states that are, you know, blue that we don't expect Republicans to be successful you know, is it just sort of this philosophy? Were there were there other sort of lessons that will travel in terms of your experience in this campaign? Yeah, that's a good question. I think first of all, you you have to have candidates who are reflective of the states and the areas that they're that they're running in. Uh, you know, I'm obviously Asian American. Uh, Twenty percent of California's population is Asian American. It's the fastest growing uh, minority group in California. Uh, it's a community that's been through a lot over the last couple of years. It's, it's been a very challenging time. And by the way, the fact that I would even acknowledge and say that is a surprise to some, but the reality is it's, it's, it's obvious. It's, it's uh, in everything that I do, uh, my identity and, and my upbringing and my uh, identity as a son of immigrants permeates how I think about the world, how I think about public policy, how I think about a lot of things. And so I think, first of all, having candidates who are reflective of uh, of the community, of what a state looks like and, and is, I think is crucially important. And so, you know, I, I think that's the first thing. I would say the second thing is you have to be willing to say and speak what's on your mind. In politics, that's really hard. I experienced those pressures myself. Um, you know, I made no secret of the fact that I did not support Donald Trump in 2016 and 2020. I don't believe he's the right person to lead my party going forward. Um, there's a lot of things he did while he was in office, by the way, that substantively, I think were probably the right thing. But at the end of the day, I don't, I just, you know, I think it's important to be able to willing, you know, be able to, to say the things you need to say. Now, I, I have the luxury of running in California where that's not a particularly controversial point of view. Uh, I've talked to people in other states who say, listen, I could never do that because I'd never get out of a primary or I'd never be able to um, to, to ensure the support of my political base. And I, and I understand that perspective. On the other hand, I would say that, um, that the, the view of making sure that you're articulating you know, what's on your mind and what you think you need to do, I think, I think is important. And it's something that I, uh, I always wanted at the end of the day, when the campaign was over, I could look my, my wife and my family and, and my friends and my supporters in the eye and say, we ran a campaign that was consistent with who I am and, and what I'm trying to do for my state. And so I think having a little bit of that ethos is, is going to be important. Um, I'll say tactically, the thing that, that, that is important to recognize is that 
so much of our of our political system and the uh, you know the the way that you turn out voters and the way that you motivate people uh, is so different now than when I was working more in in national politics, which is you know through up through about 2016 was the last presidential cycle I was really involved in, and and the world has changed a lot. And and I think the lesson you learn is that the way you communicate with people, the way that you break through now. It is very different than it was, you know, even six or eight years ago. And I think that we have to be comfortable communicating in all sorts of fora and, and media that candidates probably didn't have to be comfortable communicating in before. Uh, you know, so I think about the kind of content that we produce, the way that we interacted with people, the use of social media and how we used it to, to communicate our message. Um, those are lessons that I think are very important for people to learn that you can't expect 2016 tactics to work in 2022 or 2024. And I think that evolution of how people consume and they look at information in the political sphere uh, is, is very different now. And I think you have to learn that lesson. So I think there's a lot of things that travel. I think the reality is that the kind of Republican who gets elected in California is probably going to be pretty different than the kind of Republican gets elected in Missouri or anywhere else for that matter, right? And, and, and so I think you have to acknowledge that some of the baseline thinking may be uh, transportable or, or, or movable, but each state is very different, you know, and, and you learn that by working in federal policy, which, you know, has been the bulk of my career, that we have a remarkable federalist system in our country, but that also means that there's a lot of stuff that doesn't translate, quite frankly, and, and you have to be willing to acknowledge and accept that. So, um, I mean, California still has, you know, committed, avid Trump supporting Republicans. Sure. I'm wondering how did you, uh, you know, you and I have written together on campaign strategy. So I'm wondering, as you sat down and thought about your, your campaign strategy, um, you know, how did you build a tent to not alienate, you know, the base, but also bring in, in new voters? Well, we, we focus on issues of commonality and, and, and how you build a, a bigger movement. And, you know, I, I never made it personal because it's, it's not personal, right? I don't, I don't have any personal animus for really, you know, any, any current leader in any party. So I don't really, it was never personal for me. It was just a, a difference in approach and what I believe the right thing is for the state and for the country. And, and, you know, when I was asked about it, that's what I would say. But I, but I also really tried to focus in on areas where I felt like we could agree. Uh, and you know, those areas, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the failure of governance in California is so patently obvious. I, th I think to anybody who has lived here or lives here or follows California, nobody can look at this state and say it's well governed. I, I you know, maybe the the fiercest partisans or the supporters of the current governor will say that, but I think no reasonable observer or analyst can say that the state is well run. It's not. Uh, and so in my view, focusing on those failures of governance, but going one step further and saying, how are we going to address them? That was really how I think we built a pretty durable coalition of people on the right and all the way through the left. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it, it, there are uncomfortable conversations for sure. And, and, you know, there's all sorts of different things where people can either choose to agree or disagree with you. You know, as, a, as an element of political strategy, I will say this, Andrew, we were very cognizant of wanting to make sure we were in a position where we could win a general election by not having a primary election. Uh, I worked very, very hard during the, the months leading up to my declaration of candidacy. And then when I became a candidate, we worked very hard to keep the field clear to make sure people understood that I was gonna to put together a serious effort that would represent the party well, that would have enough financial support and resources to actually run a real campaign. I mean, the reality is it's been a long time since a, a real legitimate campaign has been run by Republican statewide in California. So there's a lot of people who just jump in because they see it as a way to raise their name identification or raise their profile statewide to do something after the campaign is over. But we made it very clear for this office, you know, which I, I, it's it's a little bit of a random office. If people look at it and they don't study the the rationale for the office and why it is that it's significant, you could see how someone might just jump in and run for the heck of it. 
but we made, we made sure to do the work we needed to do. And it was a lot of hard work. There were a lot of people who popped up along the way and said, well, I'm thinking about running for a controller. And, you know, we had to convince them that that wasn't the right thing to do. So in the politics of politics, if you are able to give yourself more space to run the kind of campaign you need to run, uh, you know, it, it, it enables, I think, you to, to do the things you needed to do. I mean, I get the question all the time. What would you have done if you had had a competitive primary? And I, you know, I think it's a lot harder. The dynamics a lot harder. I like to think that we would have run the same campaign, that we would have emphasized the same issues. But admittedly, I think it's a lot harder if you have to run in the primary. And and I and I understand that dynamic very well. So, um, let me ask about the 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 point you just raised. Would you say a little bit more about how you were able to clear the field, like what those conversations looked like or, or negotiations looked like? And then maybe on that same note, what was the effect of the top two primary mm. that, that California has? Maybe you could say a word about yeah. that. You know, what do you think th that that impact was on California politics, either writ large or particularly in your in your situation? Yeah, it's a great it's it's a great point that we have a, a, a jungle primary in California where people don't run in partisan primaries. If you're not familiar with it, we have a system where the top two emerge from the primary regardless of party and they run against each other in general election. The theory behind uh, this movement, uh, which I'm still broadly supportive of, I, although I think the specifics are a little bit trickier. Um, the idea was to create more moderate candidates, right? That you would have moderation. And, and I think Andrew, correct me if I'm wrong, the academic research has shown that that's actually not really what's happened. That, that in fact, the top two system hasn't produced any discernible moderation in, in candidate positioning. That in fact, you know, what you still have, and I observed this firsthand, is you, is you really in most races still have a partisan primary. I, I think about my opponent, uh, the Democrat who I ran against, there were four, four Democrats, one, two, three, four, four Democrats who ran for, for controller in California this year. And, and they basically had a partisan primary to figure out who was going to come out and, and have to face me. And, you know, unsurprisingly, the, the most left leaning candidate was the one who won. Uh, and, and I ended up going against. I, I saw that as an advantage. Uh, you know, little did I know that that actually probably wasn't an advantage. But anyway, my point is, I think the, the, the concept was, if you can capture the, the, the middle, uh, you, you have the ability potentially to grow your coalition and to grow your voter base for a general election. But um, the, the reality is, you know, I think there's still partisan primaries. If you have multiple people in, in a race from the same party, you're still, particularly if you're a Republican, you're still competing for a very small percentage of the pie. So it, it turns effectively into a partisan primary. Your, your question about how we managed to clear the field. I mean, I think it's a combination of persuasion and, and, and a little bit of muscle, frankly. Uh, when One of the things that I knew I had to do because I was a first time candidate is I knew I had to establish credibility that I could do the things you need to do to be a successful candidate. And in our political system, the single best empirical measure of that is, can you raise money? Can you raise the money you need to raise to put together a campaign that can compete? And so we came out of the gate. I, I forgot you know, what it was. I think we raised our first million dollars in about two or three weeks. And, and, and so you know, I was fortunate to have a, a network of, of people who I'd interacted with over the years in business and politics and policy who were, who were interested and willing to support my effort. And so we went out and raised the low hanging fruit very, very quickly. And, and I think that that very quick action in a couple of weeks scared off anybody who might do it as a, you know, from a perspective of, of, of a, a rational player. Uh, you know, there were a couple of people who had expressed interest in running for controller who, um, uh, you know, who I think would have been very good candidates that I would not have wanted to run against. And I, you know, I think I didn't really even need to speak to them. You know, we got in relatively early. I declared my candidacy in July of 2021, raised a lot of money in the first four weeks. And that, you know, I, after that initial fundraising number came out, I got two phone calls from people who I thought might run. And they said, listen, you know, wish you the best, want to support you. And I'm not going to run. And, and that's great. Now, that doesn't address the issue of the irrational person who might want to run. And, and we had one of those. Uh, who kind of held on until about Christmas uh, and, and was making a lot of noise. And, and finally, uh, you know, a lot of 
I had a lot of go-betweens with this person, you know, people who offered to speak to him. And I said, that's great, you know, do so. Uh, I was going to continue doing what I was doing. And, you know, there came a point where it was clear he was still making noise. I said, listen, I, I got to sit down with him. And so I sent him a, a, a text and I said, hey, you know, I'm going to be in your neck of the woods and, and let's get together and, and have lunch. And I had a very frank conversation with him. And I said, listen, I'd prefer not to spend the money I've raised taking you down in a primary, but I'll do it if I have to. Uh, it's just not how I'd prefer to do it. I would hope that we can understand that if we're going to have any shot as Republicans of winning statewide in California, we're going to have to be unified and come together. And I hope that's compelling to you. But if not, make no mistake, I have no problem using as much money as I need to take you down. And, and you have to have that conversation with people sometimes. It's politics, right? So, um, uh, you know, fortunately, I didn't have to have a lot of those conversations. Fortunately, the conversation was effective. And, and he decided shortly after the holidays uh, in early 2022, he wasn't going to run. And, 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 the, and the, the field was clear. And, and we went to the Republican Party convention and got the endorsement of the party. And, you know, that, then it was sort of smooth sailing from there. We didn't really run much of a primary campaign. We conserved a lot of resources um, I think I spent a grand total of maybe $100,000, $200,000 in the primary, uh, which was a, a small proportion of what we spent overall. But, uh, you know, it was enough because we cleared the field. Very interesting. Let me let me throw two questions at you. One is from um, the chat. Um, uh, Gail Jackson asks, um, you know, you talked about issues around uh, California not being the most well-governed state. Um, are there states that you view as um, sort of models of, of good governance and what are those states and why are they considered such? Yeah. And then the second question is, I think on our call is, you know, the famous political scientist, Dan Hopkins, who I think you, you know from grad school. And Dan famous is- Famous indeed. Dan is written hey, Dan. extensively on the nationalization of politics and um, that occurring even at these very local races. And I know, you know, when there was a St. Louis um, uh, Board of Aldermen race a few years back, you know, the candidates were all very clear about whether they endorsed Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton. Yeah, You know, that's sort of emblematic of this idea that, you know, it's not Tip O'Neill, all politics are local. It's it's in fact, all politics are, are national. And so yeah. I'm wondering, whether you found that, you know, is yeah. there space for, uh, you know, a Republican that's branded differently in California or in the Bay Area or in Orange County versus, you know, the the National Party? So I'll I'll throw those two questions at you, and you yeah. can answer them in turn. Yeah, L let me answer the second, and then you may have to remind me of the first because one sure. of the things that <laughs> happens in that one of the things that happens in a campaign is like your especially after a campaign is your brain goes into hibernation mode, and so I'm I'm in I'm in hibernation mode right now. But on on the on the question of um, uh, you know, kind of the nationalization of politics, absolutely. I mean, I, I look at. I'll give you a good example. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many school board races have become, you know, effectively races that are based on national issues and national affiliations. Now, there's a lot more money going into school board races than there ever has been. And both parties and, and movements on both sides of the political spectrum are increasingly paying attention to these school board races. But, you know, I can't tell you how many school board races had candidates talking openly about their views on the overturning of Roe versus Wade, uh, you know, talking about their their views on on Trump. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, in, in my race, there's no question there was a nationalization. All my opponent wanted to talk about was Roe versus Wade. Mm -hmm. That's all she wanted. I mean, that literally, if you look back at the dialogue and if you do a dialogue tracking as we did, 98% of our communications were on an issue over which the California state controller has very little to zero control. And, and, you know, it's frustrating, but it's the reality of our politics is that her best line of attack on me was to use a national issue like abortion and a national character like Donald Trump. Um, you know, she, in several communications, called me a MAGA Republican. I, I, I don't know what else I can say to you about my background and about my positioning to make it clear where I stand. And, and so what we you know, had to do is we had to make things clear via, via, via the paid media, via our, our television advertising and, and elsewhere about where I stood. You know, I mean, I take some pleasure in the fact that 
not a single newspaper endorsed my opponent. Every single newspaper in the state of California who weighed in on this race endorsed me, including papers that haven't endorsed Republicans in 50 years. So I, I think that makes it pretty clear that her strategy of nationalizing the race was not effective with the elites, but it was very effective with the electorate, right? Because all she needed to do was to signal, hey, I'm one of you. Don't vote for the other guy. Even if you may have heard he could be a decent guy, it doesn't matter because he's a MAGA loving person who wants to you know, make abortion illegal everywhere. So the nationalization of our politics is um, absolutely, absolutely something that has affected and filtered down to even the most local of races. And I think that's a trend that's probably here to stay for a while. Um, the, the first question, Andrew, remind me was around. Um, are there are there governors? Are there states yeah, out there that you think are doing right. a good job in terms right. of, of governance? Well, listen, I um, uh, I think Charlie Baker did a did a great job as governor of Massachusetts. I, I I don't think that he was he I don't think he governed perfectly, but I think he demonstrated the kind of governance from the from the middle out that I was talking about, being a steady administrator, bringing a lot of his skills and experience to. To governing a state, which which also has a lot of challenges. So I think Charlie did well. A, a lot of these um, states in the Mountain West, I think, have good governance models. So I look at Idaho and Utah as two examples uh, of of states. You know, in, in the case of Utah, there's a little bit of extremism creeping in that I don't like to see. I think there also that one party governance model has been an issue. Although you know, a, as recently as a few years ago, Utah's elected Democrats to the United States Congress. There's a, there's a the Salt, Salt Lake itself is a quite diverse community uh, that that reflects some political difference. So, uh, but I think Utah and Idaho, when people used to ask me about this concept I have of bringing all of our state expenditures online and providing accountability for them, I would point to states like Idaho, Ohio is another state that had a state checkbook that was put into effect a few years ago that I think is a really meaningful thing. So th there are examples, I think, of good governance, maybe not all the way through, but you know, in the examples of certain leaders, you know, when I look at someone like Charlie Baker or Doug Ducey in Arizona or, uh, or uh, Larry Hogan in, in Maryland, who recently left uh, as governor there, I, I think you find that there are some examples of, of good governance sprinkled throughout the state. And I think that was the intention of, of the founders to create a federalist system where you could see a greater amount of that experimentation and a greater amount of that growth of good ideas at the state level before they germinated up to, to Washington. Great. Thank you. Um, let me let me turn a little bit towards um, national politics. Um, we we have a question from the, the audience um, talking about the the future of the Republican Party and a lot of of questions that we had in anticipation of this talk um, were were around that question what is the future of the um, GOP we had a question that, that says at the national level it often seems like Republicans have little interest in governing so you know what do you view as the future you know how can the republican party be more viable and and as you said it's important that we have a viable rigorous two party system uh yeah I, I mean if i had an answer to the question about the future of the republican party i you know i I'd, I'd be in a different place but i uh you know i think there's a few issues that um that are important to raise first of all the the presidential nominee for a party has a, a big influence on the image of a party as well as what a party actually stands for in a lot of ways, right? One of the reasons why the Republican Party has taken a more a populist turn over the last couple of years is because of the last Republican president and presidential nominee. Um, you know, Trump had a, a more populist edge to a lot of what he was advocating for. And there, there are people in uh, in in my party, including one of your United States senators, who tends to take a more populist view of a lot of issues. And so I think that is something that uh, we're going to see uh, some of these shifts in real time as the Republican Party has a nominating contest. Whoever the party ends up nominating, that will in some degree determine the way in which the party moves and the direction in which it moves, both politically as well as from a policy perspective. The, the second thing to bear in mind is that the, the nature of the Republican majority in the House is, is such that it, it effectively precludes governing. Uh, 
Uh, and I would say that's also the case, given that you have a Democratic Senate and a Democratic president. I think from, from where we are now, it precludes governing in the sense that our politics preclude governing. Uh, because our politics are oriented towards satisfying the bases and the extremes, and that makes it very difficult then to try and move toward the middle and achieve consensus. I'm not sure, by the way, that even some of the people on the left who are Democrats in the Congress would want to see that consensus because it runs against their political incentives as well. So, you know, while we'd like to think that President Biden will turn in the same way that President Clinton did as he approached his reelection campaign, and became really a moderate deal maker. I'm not so sure that the same dynamics are in play for Joe Biden today as they were for Bill Clinton back in, in 1995 and 1996. So the, the historical analog is very hard to draw. And, and I think it's it's hard to envision that the Republican Party changes a whole lot until the presidential contest gets gets worked out. Um, you know, I'm not a huge believer in, you know, every couple of years, the party conducts some kind of like autopsy or some kind of a examination of, you know, what it ought to do. And there's great ideas and great thinking and none of it ever gets followed. I think about, you know, post 2012, there was a, a process to try and, and determine what the Republican Party needed to be more successful uh, in national elections. And, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that was in there is stuff that I've alluded to, you know, nominate candidates who look like the communities they come from, espouse policies that try and build from the middle out, think about how we can raise people out of poverty through uh, the free enterprise system and really have economic policies that are oriented toward doing that. All of those concepts and ideas that we saw in the, in the post-2012 era that I thought made really good sense None of them got adopted, and then the party nominated Donald Trump. So it's a it's an interesting um, path that these things take. So I don't, you know, I don't know if we're going to know a whole lot more about what the future of the party looks like until we get on the other side of this nominating contest in in 2024. Let me say one other thing. I I, I think the Republican Party is a healthy, uh, has strong health in a lot of parts of the country. The danger for the Republican Party is it becomes a regional party that it really becomes a party that is very successful in parts of the South, parts of the Mountain West, and maybe pockets in the Midwest, but is totally uncompetitive on the West Coast, totally uncompetitive in the Eastern Seaboard, and, and really reflects only parts of the country as opposed to a true governing coalition that brings together rural Americans and urban Americans and everybody in between. That vision of a party that can govern for multiple parts of the American population uh, I think that vision is the one the Republican Party needs to aim toward, as opposed to further entrenching its its strong regional status. I mean, there's no question, it is a very strong party in parts of the country. But you know, to truly, I think, be a strong governing party and a durable party for the long run, there needs to be a vision that espouses governance in all different parts of the country, and and that's not really where the party is right now. And and I think to be a stronger party, it's got to move in that direction. I'm wondering if you can reflect, I mean, you've been, you know, in the room when it happens, uh, really since 2008 with, with the Bush campaign, such a prominent role with, with uh, Romney Ryan and, and Rubio as well. Um, not to bring Trump into every discussion of the Republican Party, but there's conversations, you know, is Trump a symptom or a cause of the state of the Republican Party that you described today? I'm just wondering if you can reflect on how presidential campaigns have changed in the time that you've been working on them and, and how that experience sort of fits into where the Republican Party finds itself today. It's changed a lot. Um, you know, I, uh, one of the classes I teach is a graduate course on uh, the policy formation and implementation process. And, and one of the classes that I, that I add that's not typically part of the, the curriculum for a class like that in a, in a public policy program is a class on, on how policy made in campaigns influences uh, policy made in government, in government, in a governing setting. It's obviously personally significant to me, but when I think about the nature and organization of a presidential campaign, when I was coming up you know, in the 2000s and into 2012 and 2016, you had a full-fledged policy operation that would put together 
you know, pretty sophisticated thinking about what a president would do on economic policy, on foreign policy, on, you know, all, all measure of different policy areas. And, and you wrote long white papers that the media would actually cover and they'd actually say, here's the candidate's plan and they would analyze it and third party sources would analyze it. And you have a robust conversation about, hey, what's the impact of uh, going to a system where you allocate tax expenditures or an individual allocates them as opposed to the government allocating them. What does that look like, right? And and so y- those kinds of conversations used to be fairly fairly common. And then in 2016, we kind of fell off the cliff, right? Because there wasn't substantive policy conversations. And and you know I think the organization of campaigns changed. And then in 2020, the extension of that was the more important thing was talking about policy rather than really developing policy. And so it became about communicating and how do you communicate in platforms like Instagram and and Twitter and and how do you communicate policy as opposed to really developing policy. And I think that was a major difference that we saw as the, as the years went on. Um you know campaigns are able to uh, know so much more about voters now. I mean, we knew a, an incredible amount about what our target voters watched, what they liked, what they listened to. I mean, we, we have so much more information about people. It enables a micro-targeting of message in a way that was not possible probably in 2012 and 2016 even. Now, the danger you run into now is that the message fatigue is very real, and it's much harder now to break through than it was before. Before, you know, I mean, you ran some great TV ads and you could break through. Uh, now it's it's a lot harder. And by the way, it's also a lot harder to measure what you and your opponent are doing in the digital space. The, the kind of tracking tools that are available when you're looking at how many gross rating points, for example, a candidate buys in a television ad buy in one television market is very easy to see. You can't hide that. If I, if I buy a set of advertising in the San Luis uh, Obispo area or in Bakersfield, it's known what I've bought and you can see the creative I'm running. Digital's not that way. There's a lot of stuff happening under the surface you can't measure. And that makes it harder for campaigns really to, to actualize a strategy and to think about the tactics that they would employ now versus in 2012 when it was fairly easy to track all this stuff. So yeah, campaigns at the presidential level have changed a lot. And, and a lot of the people I know who were top practitioners of the craft of campaign advising in 2008, 2012, they're not the same people who are at the top of the game now. And it's a very, very different environment. And, and so the, the, the new regime, would you say they're more sort of digital social media oriented and less policy oriented or or what is the yeah is i the think i think crop? yeah I, I think that's fair uh, you know to the extent that any campaign was ever policy oriented i think <laughs> that campaigns you know I, I had the i had the good fortune in my view of working for a guy in mitt romney who really wanted policy to be forward in his campaign and put a lot of emphasis in the and the organizational structure of the campaign and the amount of things I had to manage reflected his point of view, which is that he wanted a substantive campaign. Uh, Paul Ryan, our vice presidential nominee, is the same was the same way. He, he's still the same way to this day. They both are. So I, I think that um, th- that part probably was a little bit idiosyncratic, but as a general matter, the ability to communicate a message via social media, is so much more important now than even the nature of the substance that 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 drives a lot of that conversation, unfortunately. Yeah, very interesting. Um, we have a question uh, from Tim McBride, who is uh, a, a health economist. Um, taking a slightly longer view, he, he asks about the urban-rural divide, which is a mm-hmm. question close to my research interests. Um, he, he raises the point that if you look, you know, New Deal, you think RFK, the the uh, rural voters tended to be more democratic, but obviously we've seen that change over time. And so uh, he's wondering if if you have any commentary on why that change has happened, or maybe any experience in, in your campaign on you know what that urban rural divide is is actually all about. Yeah, I, I mean, I on the on the research and what the research tells us about why that shift has happened, I'd certainly de- defer to to those who are doing that work. I think my observation is that in 
in in rural areas over the last uh, you know several decades, the relative ordering of cultural politics versus economic politics, for example, has changed. Uh, I think cultural, I, I, I call it cultural politics. I mean, really what I mean by that is a whole set of issues that are reflective of the state of, of the cultural milieu that surrounds uh, you know, where people live and where they work and what they do, right? So uh, that can be social issues. It can be um, you know, it, it, what's in vogue now is to talk about the rise of so-called woke politics. I think that's a cultural issue. I think that the predominance of the cultural layering has become more significant in a lot of rural areas than it has in, in suburban or exurban or, or urban areas. And so I think as a result, the Republican Party, I think, has successfully spoken to rural voters on those cultural issues in a way that has created some pretty strong allegiances. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, in my own experience, when I would go to more rural areas and, you know, I, I, I would really think hard about what are the issues that I believe really impact this community, which are not cultural issues, because I, I didn't, those weren't really, I didn't want those to be a part of my campaign. And I didn't think that they were relevant to the execution of my office. And so I'd go to a, a part of the state, for example, where it was rural, but I'll tell you the top issue, even above all these cultural issues was water. We have, you know, water politics in California are extremely complicated. Uh, they're politically very important. And I knew if we talked about what I as controller could do to ensure the proper uh, supply of water or accountability for water stock to a particular part of the state, that was going to be a heck of a lot more interesting than anything else I could talk about, right? And so uh, in, in other parts of the state, it's, it's issues relating to forest management. We have a massive issue in California, as many of you may know, with wildfires in the summer. And, and some of that is climate driven. Some of that is frankly forest, bad forest management practices. And so when I went to rural parts of the North state where I knew cultural politics were, I'd going to get asked about them, that's fine. I'll give the answer. But let's talk about what I can do to ensure greater accountability for funding that goes to CAL FIRE, which is our state firefighting and, and forest management agency. So, you know, it's a it, during the campaign, you you see it, you see how prominent the cultural politics are in some parts of state. Now, the cultural politics, by the way, are also prominent in in the Bay Area where I live. They're just prominent in a different way. And so it's not just that the cultural politics have become more significant in rural areas. The development over the last, I think, decade has been how those cultural politics have become more prominent in urban areas and suburban areas as well. And that in turn has shifted the aperture of voters and the ability of the Republican Party specifically to compete in some of these, in some of these uh, suburban and exurban areas. Yeah, that's very interesting. You, of course, missed the... Uh the you know the now the gas stove the politicization of gas stoves as a cultural issue i guess that came up post your uh your campaign yeah i i, I would have been conflicted because we have a gas stove and i very <laughs> much like my gas stove and so if someone were really trying to take it away which we can debate whether that's true or not i, I i'd have issues with that um we, we only have a couple minutes left um i wanted to ask um maybe a little bit of a less substantive question if you had any highlights or lowlights to share as a as a campaign advisor uh, over over the years, yeah, um, oh, as an advisor, not as a candidate. So so yeah, I yeah. so the so the for me at least the the highest of highs. Some of you might remember uh, there. Well, you, you'll know there are usually several presidential debates during the course of a campaign, and in 2012. Um, Mitt Romney had a very good first debate against President Obama, and it was in Denver. And, and a big part of my job, you know, in the weeks leading up to that, to all of the debates was to make sure that my candidate was properly prepared for those debates. And, and, and I spent a lot of time with him getting ready and, and knew how personally important it was to him to have a strong showing and how politically important it was to us as, as a campaign. And, and to witness that debate and to feel like you're a part of it and to see what's happening unfold and then to see the outcome of that, which was really a, a tightening of the race in the, in the days and weeks after that debate, uh, was, was a, it's just, it's hard to, um, you know, some, some people 
when they're young envisage playing in the Super Bowl. I always envisaged, you know, advising a presidential candidate in a in a debate like that, and I got to do it, and and he was successful, and it was a real thrill for me. Um, you know, the 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 tough part of it is, and the reason why I don't think I'd ever work on another presidential campaign in the same way as I did in 2012 is the amount of time it takes from from your life and and from your family. And um, you know, my son was very young at the time; he was he was two, and I'd spend a lot of time away. I mean, weeks at a time, you'd be on the road, right? And so I think, and by the way, running for office is not a whole lot different than that. Um, these are difficult things and they're difficult trade-offs. And I would say that um, the reason why the campaign business gets younger and younger is because that's who can do these jobs, right? And so uh, for me, that was always hard, you know, balancing the the family life with what I wanted to do professionally. And I think, uh, it continues to be a, a challenge for a lot of people. So, uh, but but it's you know I always tell my students, and to the extent there are students here, I, I guess my my closing wisdom would be: if you have an opportunity to work on a presidential campaign or have interest in doing that, do it. I, I mean, it's a remarkable experience. It's a wonderful way to see parts of the country that you're probably not familiar with, and it's a great way to see our political system really up close. Ani, the only problem with talking to you is, you know, we need another hour to talk about health care, another hour to talk about U.S.-China policy and, and on and on. So I hope um, you'll come back and, and visit us. Maybe we can, we can have you in St. Louis sometime. Um, but just thank you so much for, for sharing your, your time with us today. It was a real honor to be able to, to have a conversation with you. Well, thank you, Andrew, and, and congratulations on, on all the center is doing, and I look forward to seeing you in person soon. Great. Thank you, Lanhi. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today, and um, please consider attending uh, our next uh, Wiedenbaum event with Nate Jensen. We'll share that link all with you soon. So thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day, everybody.